Jesus Christ was affected by the brokenness of our world. He suffered, he experienced fear and death, and he died that we might find salvation in him. So today let's remember Christ's crucifixion and that he has walked the path of suffering. So let us bow our heads in prayer. I do the open prayer. Almighty God, hear our prayer and look with mercy on your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and to be given over to the hands of sinners and to suffer death on the cross who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. We're now going to sing our first song, A Broken Spirit. A broken spirit and a contrite We now move into a time of confession as we are invited to examine our lives on this Good Friday. So friends, what part of ourselves is found in the shadow of the mob that streamed to Calvary? What part of ourselves create nails in other forms that wound our brothers and sisters and our God? Complicity, 
apathy, guile oppress us and stifle our joy. So first in a moment of silence, let us bring our sins to God in genuine repentance. We pause as we examine our lives. Can I ask Regan and Davine if you can please read the prayer of confession for us? Regan and Davine. Merciful Father, we meet each other today at the foot of the cross. We wait with each other as those who inflict wounds on one another. Have mercy on us as those who spurn your love for other loves. Be merciful to us, as those who put our trust in power and prestige. Be merciful to us, as those who pursue only our own personal interests. Be merciful to us, as those who put others on trial. Be merci to us, as those who refuse to forgive. Be merciful to us, as those who are afraid of the world's frown and displeasure. Be merciful to us. Amen. So brothers and sisters, Christ bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By Christ's wounds we have been healed. Believe the good news of the gospel. We now listen to the first reading that Bion will read for us. The first reading is taken from Isaiah reading from chapter 30, verse 13 of chapter 52 up until verse 12 of chapter 52. The suffering servant. The Lord says, my servant will succeed in his task. He will be highly honored. Many people were shocked when they saw him. He was so disfigured that he hardly looked human. But now many nations will marvel at him, and kings will be speechless with amazement. They will see and understand something they had never known. The people reply, who would have believed what we now report? Who could have seen the Lord's hand in this? It was the will of the Lord that his servant should grow like a plant taking root in dry ground. He had no dignity or beauty to make us notice of him. Take notice of him. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing that would draw us to him. We despised him and rejected him. He endured suffering and pain. No one would even look at him. We ignored him as if he were nothing. But he endured the suffering that should have been ours the pain that we should have borne. All the while, we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. But because of our sins, he was wounded, beaten because of the evil we did. We are healed by the punishment he suffered. 
made whole by the blow he received. All of us were like sheep that were lost, each of us going his own way. But the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserve. He was treated harshly, but endured it humbly. He never said a word, like a lamb about to be slaughtered, like a sheep about to be sheared, he never said a word. He was arrested and sentenced and led off to die, and no one cared about his fate. He was put to death for the sins of our people. He was placed in a grave with evil men. He was buried with the rich, even though he had never committed a crime or ever told or died. The Lord says, it was my will that he should suffer. His death was a sacrifice to bring forgiveness. And so he will see his descendants. He will live a long life, and through him my purpose will succeed. After a long a life of suffering, he will again have joy. He will know that he did not suffer in vain. My devoted servant, with whom I am well pleased, will bear the punishment of many, and for his sake I will forgive them. And so I will give him a place of honor, a place among the great and powerful men. He willingly gave his life and shared the fate of evil men who took the place of many sinners and prayed that they might be forgiven. Hear the word of the Lord. Friends, we will now listen to Psalm 31. Can I please ask Norma and Lenny if you can respond with the lines in bold black? Into your hands, Lord, I commit my spirit. Norma and Lenny. Thank you. Psalm 31. To you, Lord, have I come for shelter. Let me never be put to shame. Oh, deliver me in your righteousness. Incline your ear to me and be swift to save me. Into your hands, Lord, I commit my spirit. For my life wears out in sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails me in my affliction and my bones are consumed. I am become the scorn of all my enemies, and my neighbors wake their heads, heads in the region. Into your hands, Lord, I commit my spirit. I am a thing of horror to my friends, and those that see me in the street shrink from me. I am forgotten like a dead man out of mind. I have become like a broken vessel. In your hands, Lord, I commit my spirit. For I hear the whispering of many, and fear is on every side, while they plot together against me and scheme to take away my life. Into your hands, Lord, I commit my spirit. But in you, Lord, have I put my trust. I have said, you are my God. All my days are in your hand. Oh, deliver me from the power of my enemies and from my persecutors. Into your hands, Lord, I commit my spirit. But you heard the voice of my supplication. When I cry to you for help, be strong and let your heart take courage, all you that hope in the Lord. Into, Into your hands, Lord, I commit my spirit. And now we listen to the second reading from the book of Hebrews that Yusuf Lachporia will read for us. <clears throat> the reading is taken from Hebrews 13. Reading from verse 8 to verse 16. Jesus Christ is the same 
yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods which are of no value to those who eat them. We have an altar from which those who minister in the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most high place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess, that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Thus is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now sing our next, next hymn, There is a Green Hill Far Away. Our gospel reading is from John chapter 19, reading from verse 1 to 37. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, O King of the Jews! and they struck him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I have found no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, Yes, take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, We have a law, 
and according to that law he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize that I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat him down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aram Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of, charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write to the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, for the undergarments remained. This undergarment was seamless woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that it was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it up to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished, and with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. 
The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that it tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they had pierced. Omar? I'm here. Let us pray. Almighty and most gracious God, I give you thanks and praise for the blessing of this day. For it is in this moment, in this hour, on this day, that we realize just how much you truly loved us, Father. And that your love enduring not only then, but for eternity, will see us through whatever comes. And for that we give you thanks. And now, Lord, I pray that you will bless the words that you've laid upon my heart. And all who are listening to this, Father, I pray that you'll give them the blessed assurance that you have never left us nor forsaken us. In Jesus' holy name I pray for this. Amen. This day I have had the pleasure of bringing the word, and it has always been a difficult time for me to prepare for this sermon because it is so moving and touching and always brings tears to my eyes. When I think of our Lord in Gethsemane, telling his father, this is the hour, this is the time, and the blood poured from his head in little droplets of sweat, one begins to understand the enormity of the amount of sin that we as mankind have placed upon our Lord. Because we are told in the word that the sin that he bore for us was not only the sins of the time or what happened before, it was all the sins to come. Our sins today, the sins that we will still commit, and believe me, when our Lord says, there is no definition between a small sin and a big sin. Sin is sin. Whether you have raped somebody, whether you have murdered somebody, whether you lie to somebody, whether you have stolen from somebody, whether it be in action or in deed, it is sin. So all of mankind from the beginning of time until our Lord comes again. All the sins that we are committing has been heaped on our Lord hanging on that cross. Do you understand the enormity of the burden that he had to bear for us? If you have an inkling of it, you will begin to understand how much he loves us. You will begin to understand how much he appreciates you and me for turning to him. For it is in our testimony, in our lives, and in our word, that we believe in him and trust in him, that we bring joy to him. For he hung there, and when everything was done, uttered words that rings through generations, even up until this day, that it is finished. And that word is so hard for people to understand and appreciate because if you fully understand and appreciate that word, you will realize what it means to have faith in him. Because faith comes with that word. It is finished. Everything that had to be done has been done. No man can stand before the Father and say, I am guiltless of sin. We are all sinners. And because of that, Jesus says, he came, paid that enormous price, died for us, received that horrible wounds, bled for us. And today, we must remember when he says it is finished, that it's not up to us to want to try and undo things that we have done. What it is up to us for is to remember 
that if we place our trust in him and believe in him with our whole hearts and minds, that is all he asks of us. There is no way to the Father except through the Son. He is the one who has died for us. He is the one who says, trust in me. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And you know, at a time when the world is in turmoil because of what the, uh, the world and Satan is trying to do to the, to the people of God, because we are living in the, in the final days of, our, of, of this world. Our Lord is coming, and just about everything has been fulfilled as far as the book of Daniel and Revelation is concerned. There are a few things that still has to happen, but we are coming closer to that day. And, and the world and Satan, because Satan is still in this world and still has a very good control over it. The big organizations, the rulers of this world, even though they don't realize it, are all serving the Satan. But God is in control. Everything that is happening, everything that is about to happen is still in God's hands. And most amazingly enough, all of us is in his hands. And you know, they, they, th they thought that if they close the churches, they will have one over us. But they are wrong. The people of God has come to realize that the church is within our hearts. That temple that we so crave is within our hearts. And here we are sitting today, talking to each other, being the true church of our Lord Jesus Christ, sitting together, looking at each other on the internet, talking to each other, and praising God in a way that brings joyful noise unto the Lord. We brothers and sisters in Christ, have a victory to celebrate. You know, when I was doing this preparation, I, I read something what, that was quite amazing. God does not find, fight a battle the way we, men, or the world fights a battle. When we go into battle, we take our weapons our, and we put it in front. We take our strongest men and we put it in front. And we go into battle, prepared. And the generals and the rulers all stand way behind, shouting us on and giving us instruction. But there are beautiful stories in the Old Testament that tell us how God goes into battle. I read the story of uh, how God went into battle to destroy the, the city uh, with these, uh, the Israelites having to march around the city. Most amazingly enough, he put the tabernacle, he put the, the Ark of the Covenant right in front. He then put his priest, he then put the uh, trumpets and bugles that were supposed to blow behind them. He then put the, the tambourines, all the other musical instruments, and all the singers, and then the army and the people came, and they were not going to make a noise. He said to them, sing joyful noises, rejoice. God is telling us the battle that we are facing today. He is right in front. We coming on behind have to place our trust in him. He hung on that cross for us. He took all that we could offer on him. And now he tells us, trust me, this battle I am fighting for you. This battle we are winning. This battle I want you to rejoice in it and say to your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, we have won this battle. God is in control. God will lead us to victory because he has never failed anyone throughout all ages and is not going to start now. We belong to him. We are his. Every hair on your head belongs to him and he knows it. So he is not going to turn your back on you. 
He didn't die on that cross so that he could sit back and laugh and say, look what they have done to themselves. No, he died on that cross so that he could say, this is my church. This is my children. I will be, love them. I will look after them. I will take care of their needs. Trust in God, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray that that cross that you look on, pray that that cross that you hold so dearly in your life is the final victory that God won for us. That victory that will bring us into his kingdom where we will live a beautiful life with each other, where we will be able to hug each other once again, where we will be able to hold each other and hold each other, giving each other peace. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we truly are blessed this day to be reminded by that cross that Jesus did all this for us. So let us not lose heart or faith. I know there's been given an extra two weeks for us to stay at home. And in that two weeks, the church will grow stronger because we will spend more time preparing and looking out for each other in prayer. And you know, if there's one thing that I believe our Father rejoices in, it's to see his children in prayer. So please don't lose heart. Trust in God. And as Jesus says, trust also in me, for he is with us even unto the end of the age. Amen. Amen, Umar. We now move into a time of reflection as, reflect, as we reflect on the words that we have heard from Umar. Friends, we will now sing our next song, which is Thank You for the Cross, Lord.
We're now moving. Varun, will you lead us in the praise, please? Yeah, I'm now very getting ready to lead you into the praise. Just checking that the sound is on. Let us pray. I will keep silence in between the prayers. Please feel free to say a silent prayer in that pause if you don't mind. Today, Christ offers his life to the Father for the salvation of humankind. In union with him, we now pray that all may receive the benefits of his passion. For the church, let us pray, dear friends, for the Holy Church of God throughout the world, that God, the Almighty Father, may guide it and gather it together so that we may worship him in peace and tranquility. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Christ, your Son. Guide the work of your church. Help it to persevere in faith, to proclaim your name, and to bring your salvation to people everywhere. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For the clergy and the laity of the church, let us pray for Steve, our bishop, together with Tabo Metropolitan, for all bishops, priests, and deacons, especially Reverend Shamain, our rector, for those who have a special ministry in the church, and for all God's people. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Listen to our prayers and help all in their own vocation to do your work more faithfully. Lord, in your mercy. For those preparing for baptism and confirmation, let us pray for those preparing for baptism and confirmation that God in his mercy may make them responsive to his love. Almighty and eternal God, you continually add to your church those whom you call. Increase the faith and understanding of those preparing for baptism and confirmation and make them faithful members of your chosen family. Lord, in your mercy. For the unity of Christians, let us pray for all our brothers and sisters who share our faith in Jesus Christ, that God may gather and keep together in one church all those who seek the truth. Almighty and eternal God, you keep together those you have united. Look kindly on all who follow Jesus, your Son, we are consecrated to you by our common baptism. Make us one in the fullness of faith and keep us one in the fellowship of love. Lord, in your mercy. Now pray. For the Jewish people, let us pray for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God, that they may continue to grow in the love of his name and confess Jesus as Messiah. Almighty and eternal God, you gave your promise to Abraham and his descendants. Grant that the people you first made your own may arrive at the fullness of redemption. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, I'll pray. For those who do not believe in Christ, let us pray for those who do not believe in Christ, 
that the light of the Holy Spirit may show them the way of salvation. Almighty and eternal God, whom all seek, even unknowingly, open the eyes of those who know not Christ, that they may find him in him alone, the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, I'll pray. For those who do not believe in God, we pray for them. Almighty and eternal God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Have mercy on all who live in doubt and unbelief, that they may know you, the one creator God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, I'll pray. For those in public office, we pray for them that God will guide their minds and hearts so that all may live in true peace and freedom. Almighty and eternal God, in your goodness, watch over those in authority so that people everywhere may enjoy true freedom, security, and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, I'll pray. For those who are in special need, we pray for our dear, we pray, let us pray, dear friend, that God, the Almighty Father, may heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers, free those unjustly deprived of liberty, and rid the world of falsehood, hunger, and disease. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask all this through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we finally we pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, we're now going to move into the time where we adore the cross of Jesus Christ. I will do the lines in, in red. Lance, can I please ask you if you can do the lines in blue? Lance Goodall. Basil Rhodes, can I please ask you if you can do the lines in bold black? I will do the lines in red. If Lance can do the lines in blue. And Basil Rhodes. And do the lines in black. Thank you, Lance. You're welcome. Lord, by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. We adore you, Christ, and we bless you. My people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I led you out of Egypt from slavery to freedom. 
that you led your Savior to the cross. My people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. Holy God, God, holy and strong, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. For 40 years, I led you safely through the desert. I fed you with manna from heaven and brought you to a land of plenty that you led your Savior to the cross. Holy is God, holy and strong, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. What more could I have done for you? I planted you as my fairest vine, but you yielded only bitterness. When I was thirsty, you gave me vinegar to drink, and you pierced your Savior's side with a lance. Holy is God, holy and strong. Holy immortal one, have mercy on us. I opened the sea before you, but you opened my side with a spear. My people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I led you on your way in a pillar of cloud, but you led me to Pilate's court. My people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I bore you up with manna in the desert, but you struck me down and scorched me. My people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I gave you saving water from the rock, but you gave me gall and vinegar to drink. My people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I gave you a royal scepter, but you gave me a crown of thorns. My people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I raise you to the height of majesty, but you have raised me high on a cross. My people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. We praise and adore you, O Christ. By your cross and precious blood, you have redeemed us. Worthy is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain to receive the power and the wealth, wisdom and might, honor and glory and praise. We praise and adore you, O Christ. By your cross and precious blood, you have redeemed us. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Please hold up your crosses. Thank you, Warren. Can we go to the next screen?
say together, even if it sounds like a mumbling noise, we all say together, Holy Cross have redeemed the world. Can you please stand mute? I will now do the final blessing. Lord, send your abundant blessings on your people. We have devoutly recalled the death of your Son in the sure hope of the resurrection. Grant them pardon, bring them comfort, may their may they faith grow stronger, and their eternal salvation be assured. We now listen to our closing hymn, Yes, I'll Rise Again.
drive the nails in my hands Laugh at me Where you stand Go ahead Say it isn't me Thank you. 